Good morning, everybody. Open your Bibles to the book of Acts, the book of Acts. And as you're turning there, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my favorite movie, one of my favorite movies, I should say, and it is called The Chariots of Fire. Perhaps you've heard of it. Maybe if you've even heard that song, every time I hear the words Chariots of Fire, I just hear that beautiful piece of music start playing in the back of my head. And uh, funny story, when I was young, my siblings, we would always, every time we hear that song, we would just kind of like run in slow motion, you know, just bunch of nerds, and uh, um, we would actually get really into it and really dramatic. We'd copy Eric Little, because he had a weird way of running. He would just kind of like throw his head back and just like throw his arms and flail in the air, and so we would do that. Just imagine that in slow motion. That's what we would do, Um, but The Chariots of Fire is one of my favorite movies because it tells a little bit about the story of the Scottish um, missionary, Olympian-turned-missionary named Eric Little. Um, he, fo- the movie, it focuses on his religious conviction not to run on a Sunday. Um, and then his achievements as well as an uh, Olympian. But what they don't tell you is that he was a preacher. He was an evangelist. He preached the gospel. Uh, he grew up in China. His dad was a missionary there. And so when he... Um, got saved, he dedicated his life to be a missionary, to be an evangelist. He dedicated his life for the gospel, and he committed um, that after he was done running the, um, in the Olympics, he was going to go back to China. Um, one of the famous lines in this movie that's just been imprinted on my mind since the first time I saw it was his famous line when, in one scene, Eric states, God has a purpose for me. He made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. That's what motivated Little, pleasing God. Little was on course to break multiple Olympic records and become one of the greatest runners in the early part of the 20th century. But instead, he spent the rest of his life as a missionary in China. He died at the end of World War II, in a Japanese concentration camp. Dedicated still to bringing glory to God, whether he was running or whether he was preaching. And he died in the company of millions of martyrs who gave their life for the cause of the gospel. In fact, here's a little statistics about martyrs. The first 20 years of the 21st century, there have been about 1,900,000 Christian Christians who have been killed or have died for their faith. We get the word martyr from the biblical Greek word uh, martos, which means to bear witness. Christ says to his disciples before his ascension, you are my witnesses, my martyrs. Your life is a continual witness of the gospel. Your death is a witness to me. To live is Christ, to die is Christ. This morning, we're going to begin a series on evangelism and what has also been called witnessing. And David has asked me to kick it off, so I just feel really privileged to be here again with all of you guys. Um, But since this is going to be the first part of the series, right, this is the first part of the series of messages on evangelism, I really want to leave you with some insight on what motivations we have from the Bible and why this topic of evangelism is so important. And why this is not only an important topic, but aside from the glory of God, it's one of the most important topics of the church. Frankly, it's the reason why we're still here today. Because if we were done evangelizing, if everybody was saved, if all the Gentiles had come into the faith, we wouldn't be here. We'd be raptured. We would be in heaven. And that clearly hasn't happened yet. So that means we still have a lot of work to do. So... So not just this, this sermon, this is not going to just focus on the importance of evangelism. It's going to focus on the motivations that the Christians have for evangelism, the why behind it all. Why does this topic concern you? I mean, you all are just teenagers, right? Why do you, you have to evangelize? What's the purpose of you sharing the gospel with somebody? Why should you care about it at all? And that's why we're going to look at the motivations, your motivations for evangelizing this morning. Motivation is an essential part of life. It's the driving force behind what you do, the choices you make, the decision on what time you would get out of bed in the morning. 
what you would wear, what you would eat, all of that is determined by your desires, by your motivations, what drives you. Motivation is essential in the workforce. When somebody sees you as a hardworking person, they say that you're driven. They say that you're motivated. You're a go-getter. My favorite term to call someone is that guy's a hustler. He's a hustler. He works hard. What motivates a person is an indispensable part of that person. So today, I'm going to give you four motivations of evangelism. Four motivations for evangelism. These are the driving factors behind the Christian's proclamation of the gospel. The first motivation for the Christian is the Lord of the gospel. The Lord of the gospel. Take a look at Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The first account, O Theophilus, I composed about all that Jesus began to do and teach. This is Luke writing to Theophilus, and he's referring back to the gospel of Luke. Until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over forty days, and speaking about the things concerning the kingdom of God. And gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. We read in this momentous event in church history, right before the glorious ascension of Christ, before Christ went to be at the right hand of the Father on high, that he gave orders to the disciples. These orders are distinct from the commands he gives them to stay in Jerusalem and wait from the Holy, for the Holy Spirit, but instead they're previous commands of Christ, that he had been teaching his entire ministry by the Holy Spirit. Yet one particular commandment or order seems to be in Luke's view here. Start, turn, to, turn to Matthew 28, Matthew 28, starting in verse 18. And Jesus came up, And spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to keep all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." Christ leaves his disciples with marching orders, as it were. Orders that are very familiar to us as believers. We hear this text often in the church. It's called the Great Commission. And every gospel has some sort of version of it. And it's, go, therefore, and make disciples. The imperative, or the emphasis, the command, in this passage is not stressed on go. Go is not the command here. Rather, the Greek is an oris participle. You guys don't really care what that means at all, but, but it actually should be translated as you are going, as you are going, or having gone. The command then is make disciples. That's Jesus' focus, make disciples. As you are going, make disciples of all nations. The call of the disciple is to make more disciples, to baptize them in the name of the triune God and teach them everything Christ has taught. We evangelize because Christ has commanded us to do so. And we preach the gospel in the places Christ has brought us. When we see this text and understand it that way, it makes perfect sense why the disciples didn't see a contradiction in Christ's commands. In Matthew 28, he tells them, go, preach the gospel. And then in the book of Acts, he says, wait, wait, stay in Jerusalem, wait for the Holy Spirit. The early church left the going to the sovereign rule of Christ. They were obedient in the meantime, staying together, praying and ministering to one another. They were obedient where they were. And as you progress through the book of Acts, we see that the the same thing throughout the whole book. God chooses suffering and persecution to scatter his church all throughout Judea and Samaria, all throughout the world. And what did they do as they were being scattered? They, they preached the gospel. They made disciples wherever they were. And God added to their number such as should be saved. Christ gives the orders. Christ designs your deployment, assigns your deployment. And wherever you are, you're either making disciples or you're being disobedient. Disobedient. 
there's a very popular idea that out there that's in the churches nowadays. It's you need a passport, you need to learn a new language to really participate in the Great Commission. But it's the ministry of the entire church to make disciples, not just those who go out as missionaries, to evangelize, to preach the gospel. Every Christian is required to do so. And why did Christianity spread so fast in the first century? Because they were obedient in sharing the good news wherever they were. True Christians have a passion for evangelism. And that passion draws itself from the fact that Christians submit to and delight in Christ. And they obey Christ. The Lordship of Christ motivates us to evangelize. Because a true believer not only obeys Christ, but he thinks like his master thinks. We have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of our Lord. Christ said that a student is not above his teacher, but he will become like his teacher. That is the goal, to become more like Christ, to think like him, to talk like him, to act like him. Christ desires that people be saved. He came to seek and to save the lost. So if Christ is truly your Lord, then you will align your thoughts and desires, your interests and ambitions with his. Christ is an evangelist. He preached the good news. So if Christ is your Lord, you obey him by evangelizing and you imitate him by evangelizing. And that's what we see Paul doing. He submitted to Christ's lordship. He obeyed and imitated his Lord. Paul, you know the story, was a persecutor of the early church. He was motivated, all right, but he was motivated for all the wrong reasons. He hated Christ, persecuting him by attempting to annihilate the church. Yet Christ subdued him. Turn with me to Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Now, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. The hymn refers to Stephen. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He was delivering them into prison. Turn over just the page to chapter 9, 1. Chapter 9, verse 1. Now Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And he was traveling, and it happened that when he was approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. And the men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. And Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus, skip the verse down, named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. Skip a few verses down. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Paul then submits to the lordship of Christ. And what is the first thing he begins to do? He begins preaching the gospel in the synagogue and arguing from the scriptures that Jesus Christ is Lord, that Jesus is the Christ. 
In fact, the lordship of Christ is the main point of Peter's first sermon, the first sermon in the whole church. The inaugural address of the church, Peter uses scripture to prove that Jesus is Lord, that he's the Messiah. So turn to Acts 2, verse 32. Acts 2, verse 32. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we all are witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you both see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies as a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This Jesus is Lord. This Jesus is the Christ. The Lordship of Christ is the engine that drives Christian's motivation to evangelize. He's Lord. He is master over every person, over every animal, every blade of grass, every star and every galaxy. Christ has come to take back his rightful place as Lord of all. And everything that has breath will submit before him and declare Jesus Christ is Lord. Evangelism is a temporary thing. It's a requirement of every believer, young and old. Christ has commanded all Christians to be in some form or other evangelists, yet it's still temporary. As John Piper put it, evangelism exists because worship doesn't. The goal of the church is not evangelism. The goal of the church is not outreach. The goal of the church is to worship and glorify God. So there is no other way to worship God except through submission to the Lord Jesus. The Lordship of Christ then motivates us to obey and imitate Christ by telling others to submit to that authority. The second motivation for evangelism is the fellowship of the gospel, the fellowship of the gospel. I want to bring your attention to 1 John. So turn there with me. 1 John. 1 John 1 verse 3 shows us another motivation that the apostles had to preach the gospel. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. John declared the things he had seen and heard. He was a first-hand witness of the life and ministry of Christ. But his purpose for evangelizing here in this verse was to bring those outside of the church into the fellowship of the church. John seeks to bring them into the church because the church's fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. He continues to point to the vitality of this concept of the relationship between the fellowship of the church and the, the believer's fellowship with God. In chapter 2, verse 3, we read, And by this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. We show we love Christ by our obedience to Christ. And then John implores the church to walk in the same manner which Christ walked, and that they show their genuine conversion by loving and obeying Christ, and to walk worthy of the gospel to which they claim to believe. John states in verse 9, the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in darkness until now. Christians are defined by the love they have for one another. There's about 18 commands in the New Testament to Christians to love one another. The Christian who loves God, then, will also express that love to his neighbor. It will flow out of him. Loving your neighbor looks like doing what's best for them. And there is nothing better for your neighbor than worshiping Christ. Therefore, the true believer will develop a heart for the lost. If the greatest need in your life is a relationship with God, then to love your neighbor is to help meet that need in their life as well. 
You give them the gospel because you love them. You desire to restore them to a right relationship with God in Christ Jesus. Pastor Mark Dever explained it like this. You are not loving your neighbor as yourself if you are not trying to persuade him toward the greatest and best aspect of your own life, your reconciled relationship with God. If you are following and pursuing Christ, then by necessity you are just bound to be moved for the lost. Do you desire to love God perfectly with all your heart? Then you will be motivated to love your neighbor by giving them the gospel. The Christian loves, he longs, and he labors to share Christ. The Christian who has a heart for evangelism in their own day-to-day life sees the lost as potential family members. They see them as the potential elect people of God that God could be bringing in their life so that they can share the gospel with them and they become a conduit of their regeneration. And their motivation for that is love. This desire to see Christ glorified, to see Him worshipped, is what drove Paul. Romans 15, verse 5, we read, Now, may the God of perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another, according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He wants them to be of the same mind, so that they can glorify God in Christ. The Holy Spirit's rule in salvation includes pointing believers to Christ. Jesus says in the book of John, He, referring to the Holy Spirit, will glorify me, for He will take of mine and will disclose it to you. It is also what united the early Jerusalem church together in Acts 4. Go ahead and turn there. We're going to look at Acts 4, verse 23 through verse 31. Peter and John just healed a man, a lame man, and began preaching the gospel to large crowds of people. The chief priests brought them in to question them, and they threatened them for preaching the gospel in Jesus' name. But Peter and John were then released by the priests, and the whole church, the whole church just gathered together to listen to what had happened to them. And their response was this prayer beginning in verse 23. So when they were released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God and with one accord and said, O master, is it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly, in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servants, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your slaves may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders happen through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed earnestly, the place where they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with confidence. I want you to notice here that the overwhelming focus of this prayer is the church's concern for the glory of Christ. This fellowship of believers that focused on elevating Christ is what pushed the early Christians to evangelize. As they pray together, the focus shift from their persecution to growing the gospel of God in the world. They prayed for boldness. They prayed for confidence in proclaiming the word of God to bring more and more into the church. The third motivation for evangelism is the urgency of the gospel. The urgency of the gospel. Christians are motivated to proclaim the gospel because the message is urgent. Turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. 
verse 16 through 34 detail Paul's sermon on Mars Hill in Athens. Athens was the epicenter of idolatry in the Greek world. Acts records in verse 16 that Paul's spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So Paul began to reason and preach the gospel to the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. Those are Gentiles who um, have became Jews, who believed and uh, converted to Judaism. And in the marketplace every day, Paul preached to everyone he could. Until some of the influential people, the philosophers in Athens, brought him to the Areopagus. The Areopagus was a, a place in, that the Athens would, and travelers would gather. And they would listen to orators. They would listen to the newest philosophies and every new religion um, that came out. And so it was just the perfect place for Paul to gather and give the gospel to a large crowd. So Paul stands up and gives this sermon. Beginning in verse 24, chapter 17. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to inhabit all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for Him, and for in Him we live and move and exist. As even some of your own poets have said, for we also are His offspring. Being then the offspring of God, we ought not to suppose that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the craft and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now commanding men that everyone Everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he determined having furnished proof to all by raising him from the dead. Paul reveals the urgency of the gospel message that motivates him. In verse 30, we see that God commands everyone everywhere to repent. God did not just tell the apostles to reason with men and try to convince them that Christ offers a better way. He didn't tell us to preach the gospel for the sake of man's altruistic agenda or some sort of philanthropy. We aren't preachers of the gospel giving you a decision to make. We are preachers of the gospel bringing a command from God. Repent, believe the gospel. It's not an option. It's not an opinion. It's a command. You are either a Christian or you're a disobedient rebel of the God of the universe. Jesus didn't blind Paul with just a small glimpse of his glory on the road to Damascus and give him an option or some sort of suggestion. There was no decision. Paul says so himself in Acts 26, 19, when Paul appears before Agrippa. He tells him about his conversion story. So King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those in Damascus first and also at Jerusalem. And then throughout the, all the region of Judea and even to all the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God, practicing deeds appropriate to repentance. Paul didn't say some cute cliche about having found Jesus he didn't chalk it up to having found a better way to do life, and now all his problems are just solved in Christ. Paul said, I was not disobedient. You have one big life problem that needs to be resolved from the gospel. Are you going to be obedient to God and believe it? The message is urgent because God has commanded all men everywhere to repent and believe the gospel. The message of the gospel is urgent. And we plead men and women to believe it, to obey. The Holy Spirit says in Hebrews, today is the day of salvation. This is urgent because it's a matter of life and death. Those outside of Christ are dead in their transgressions and sins. You are spiritually dead apart from Christ. You have no ability to please God. We see the urgency of the message when Christ says in Revelation, I am coming quickly. For the believer, those words offer comfort. They're a real encouragement and to remain faithful and to a consistent sanctification and obedience to our Lord. Yet for the unbeliever, those words are like nails on a chalkboard. 
It's the constant tick and a spiraling clock of their short life. Christ will come like a thief in the night, and we don't know the day or the hour, but he is coming. So don't be found in disobedient unbelief when he arrives. The urgency of the gospel is demonstrated in the calls of repentance and belief in the gospel. I've already showed you Paul's examples of preaching the gospel and calls to repentance, so I'm going to show you one from Peter. Acts 2, verse 38 And Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ because of the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Our Lord commands and preaches repentance as well. In Luke 24, 46, 47, And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem, You are witnesses of these things. The apostles took this command seriously. They understood the urgency. Look at Acts chapter 5, verse 28. The apostles were arrested for the second time by the Jews in Jerusalem for preaching the gospel of Christ. They just got out of prison and they immediately went right back to preaching the gospel. The high priest, confounded at this, arrested them again and they questioned them in verse 28, saying, We strictly commanded you not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered and said, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you put to death by hanging him on a tree. This one God exalted to his right hand as a leader and a savior to grant repentance to Israel for forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God gave to those who obey him. The Christian is motivated to call every person to obedience. You don't know what year or month or day or hour will be your last. You don't know if you will make it through the week, let alone the day. But you can know for certain that Christ will return and his judgment is coming with him. Therefore, Colossians 1.28, Him we proclaim, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose I labor, striving according to His working, which He works in me in power. Christians are motivated because of the urgency of the message we preach. Judgment is coming. God does not owe you another moment in this life. Our message is urgent because sin is deadly. It is a matter of eternity, of life and death. We put before you what Moses put before the Israelites, the sons of Israel in the wilderness, life and death, blessing and curses, Christ as Savior or Christ as judged. Will you come all the way to the cross or will you stand afar off like a spectator? Will you not only map out the narrow way, Find the narrow way, watch others walk down the narrow way, or will you travel on it yourself? There are people in this church, and I'm sure in this very room as well, who know a good deal about Christ. They know their Bible. They know enough to get by under the radar. But the book of James says the devil knows more than you and trembles. It's not enough to know all there is about the Christian faith. You must be born again. There's no second way into the kingdom. You must enter by the narrow gate. You must go through the narrow door. There is no sitting on the fence. There will be many who will be welcomed at the gates of hell who are lingering near the gates of heaven their entire life. Go through the gates. Go all the way to Christ. Spurgeon said this, If sinners be damned, let them leap into hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled with the teeth of our exertions. And let no one go unwarned and unprayed for. The fourth motivation for the Christian for evangelism is the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel. One of the most effective marketing strategies is word of mouth. If a product is, you know, is, is well made, people will share it. People trust products when they hear something positive about it from people they trust. Word of mouth is what makes product reviews so helpful. The gospel is shared by those who have experienced its power. 
You can be motivated to share the gospel because it has divine power backing it up. It is the truth that transforms, redeems, and heals. The gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. Peter was convinced of it on the day of Pentecost where he stood up and preached the gospel of Jesus and boldly proclaimed, There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The gospel has the power to save. The believer who shares the gospel does so because of the very same truth of the gospel has radically changed him. He has tasted its power in his life and desires to make it known in others. Paul was convinced of the power of the gospel in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to, for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Corinthian church, he didn't rely on his own cleverness or, of speech, but rather on the power of God and the gospel. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the man? Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in wisdom the world through through for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God has, was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. There are plenty of people who go around claiming to have the power of God, right? You see this all the time. They have power. They say they have God's power to make up miracles and stories and ascribe them to God. They're poor, delusional Christians who go up to people and try to pray for healing and convince themselves that they are doing the work of an evangelist. They want to see miracles. They want to have a sentimental experience. And they ascribe all those things to God outpouring His power. But God has given the church power, and He put that power in the, go- in the gospel. And it seems to me that those who rely on gimmicks and false signs and wonders have completely forgotten about the sufficient power we have in preaching the crucified Christ. The fact that the gospel is the power of God to salvation just tells you everything you need to know about where the salvation comes from. It's completely and totally from God. No man participates in saving himself. It's utterly a free choice from God and a gracious work of God to bring a man to Christ. Jesus says, no man can come to me except the Father draws him. The gospel is powerful because we don't have to use our own strength, our own words, or our wisdom to get people to believe it. We don't need to convince them because God does the work. We are privileged to participate as the means he chooses to use. We, the church, is what Jesus said to Paul, a chosen instrument. We're just instruments that God uses to give people the gospel. The Holy Spirit uses the gospel through the word of God to bring people into the kingdom. You came to Christ because the Holy Spirit gave you faith to believe. Ephesians tells us that we are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. That The word that immediately precedes the phrase um, that not from ourselves. It is faith, not grace. Faith is the gift. God has given every Christian faith. And the faith comes from what? Hearing. And hearing from the word of God. We are motivated by the power of the gospel to preach the word of God because it is the power of God. It will save. It will succeed. It will bring all God's purposes to pass. The book of Acts is just a premier example of relying on the gospel and relying on the word of God to save. In Acts 5.42, we see that in every day, in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. And in Acts 2.47, and the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. So many churches seek to just lure people in by pretending um, that, that the church is nothing more than entertainment center for moralists. People don't come to Christ through gimmicks, they come to Christ through the gospel. It is the gospel that changes the chief of sinners to the Gentiles' apostle. It is the gospel that changes self-righteous Pharisees into Christian martyrs. It is the gospel that took those who nailed Jesus on the cross and made them exiles for his namesake. It is the gospel that takes Gentiles and welcomes them into Christ. The gospel is invincible. It can't be thwarted. Those who have been chosen by God 
will be saved. And you, as a young person, can be motivated to share the gospel and to preach the gospel because the power is not in you and your ability. The power is in Christ. I remember when I first shared the gospel, I was like doing a maraca uh, recital. I was shaking so much. Um, But God was able to use that to encourage someone and they were able to come to faith in Jesus Christ. I love what it says in Acts 17, 6. Turn there. And we'll be, begin reading in verse 1. Now, when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, Apollonia, excuse me, it's like, I'm going to botch this. They came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom... He went to them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and setting before them that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, who I am proclaiming to you, is that Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a great multitude of God-fearing Greeks, and not a few leading women, but the Jews becoming jealous, taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, and forming a mob set their city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the assembly. And when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These are the men, these men, who have upset the world. Come here also. I love how the King James Version puts that. These are the men who have turned the world upside down. It was the gospel that these men preached that turned the world upside down. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that unsettles and upsets the world today, just as it did then. We can rest in the power of the gospel that the Holy Spirit will do His work, because the gospel is certain, it is sure, it is powerful. The timidity of witnessing to others can be vanquished by the understanding as, that as you proclaim the gospel, God has promised that he will help you and use the truth you preach for his glory. God has not promised that everyone would be saved, but he has commanded that everyone hear the gospel and everyone repent. Witnessing, then, is an essential part of the believer's life. As you grow in your love for Christ, you will begin to grow in your love for others. And as you see the urgency of the gospel and their need to hear it, you proclaim it more and more, and you proclaim the gospel. You will have the privilege of seeing its mighty power turn the world upside down. You will see the power of the gospel, and you would see it bring life to dead sinners, which will continually motivate you to share it again and again. My hope is that it would be said of some of you, if not all of you, that these are the men and women who upset the world through the power of the gospel. Let's pray. Abba Father, we submit to your word. Lord, we see that it is a clear command to go and to preach the gospel to every creature to make disciples, and we ask, Lord, that you would help us. Lord, we pray that we would see those who are lost and as men and women who are one of your elect. And we pray that we would plead for them, because this, it's so urgent. You could be coming back any day, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you would put a fire underneath us, And give us a passion and a drive to preach the gospel so that many would come to you and have fellowship with us and that we would be able to see your mighty power through the gospel preached and proclaimed. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.